Hello and welcome to another lesson in Navy history. My name is Mr. Jones and I today I will be presenting the Cold War. The Cold War was a period of political hostility between capitalist and communist countries, in particular between the US and the Soviet Union, which from its onset in 1945 lasted for over 40 years. The term Cold War was used before 1945 to describe periods of extreme tension between states stopping just short of war. In May 1945, when the US and the USSR faced each other in Germany, this term rapidly came back into use to describe the relations between them. The Cold War is assessed through Paper 2. There are five topics on Paper 2, and you will answer two questions in total, each from a different topic. Questions for Topic 5, the Cold War, may ask you to discuss the origins and development of the Cold War, the importance of specific policies or leaders, about various crises or treaties and their effects, the impacts of proxy conflicts such as those in Korea, Vietnam, or Afghanistan, the final years of the Cold War, and so forth. You only have to answer one question in the form of an essay. Your examination will possibly contain questions regarding a single event or issue. This event or issue may be named or, or the examination paper may allow you to choose one to address. Here are some examples. To what extent was the Potsdam Conference responsible for the Cold War? Or for what reasons and what, with what results did the Suez Crisis in 1956 affect Cold War relations? Your examination will also have questions regarding more than one region during the Cold War. So for example, with reference to two Cold War communist leaders, each from a different region, compare and contrast their relationship with the Soviet Union, or examine the difference between the Soviet Union's relationships with communist governments from two different regions. Again, it's important to pick two regions that are separated by actual geographic uh, land. You need to choose two regions that are geographically separate from each other. Your examinations often have questions that begin with a quotation that must be analyzed. Here are again two examples. The Cold War began as the result of Soviet provocations at the end of the Second World War. To what extent is this statement true? The other example is, the United States was responsible for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Assess the validity of this statement. So today we're going to be covering the origins of the Cold War from 1917 to 1945. What we're doing in this video is covering a timeline of the progression of the Cold War, again, from the beginning of the Cold War, War, which is arguably the Bolshevik Revolution, I will talk about it in a second, to the very end and its aftermath. Uh, in each of the chapters that we're going to cover, in each, of the, in, in each of the materials that we're going to cover, we're going to be doing it in a uh, timeline manner. We're going to be follow following the chronology of actual events. We might separate the events into different countries, but you have to make sure that you're following that chronology. At the beginning of each presentation, I will also give you a diagram for each of the sections of the chapter so that we can analyze um, that diagram and we can arrange our notes in that specific way. I will point it out as we move on. So again, for the origins of the Cold War. When we talk about the origins of the Cold War, we, talk, we need to talk about the ideology of the Cold War. We need to talk about how these ideologies are going to be promoting different ways of, of viewing the world and promoting the different ways of actually understanding the, the global uh, state of affairs. And so we're going to start with the Ruf Russian Revolution of 1917. We're going to move to anti-Western policies from 1918 to 1935. We're going to see the Western reaction, again, from 1918 to 1933. And we're going to be seeing how the USSR um, had a defensive policy against Nazi Germany for a short period of time. And when the Nazis actually gained a lot of power, they created the Nazi-Soviet Pact. This is how we're going to be ending this specific section. So the ideology of the Cold War. Our guiding question for today, for this specific section, is going to be how are ideological differences a cause of the Cold War? 
The Cold War was a fundamental clash of ideologies and interests. Essentially, the USSR followed the ideas of Mar Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, which was basically a conflict between communism and capitalism, while the US and its allies followed liberal economics and believed in the principles of a liberal democracy. When we talk about communism, we need to establish that communism is a set of ideas that views political, social, and economic institutions in a manner that is fundamentally different from most political thought, challenging much of what we have studied. At its most basic level, it is an ideology that seeks to create human equality by eliminating private property and market forces. Communism as a political theory an ideology can be traced primarily to former uh, German philosophy Karl Marx. He was born in 1818. He writes all over, uh, all throughout the 19th century. And so Marx is going to begin with a rather straightforward observation. Human beings impart value to the objects they create because they invest their own time and labor into them. In other words, once human beings learn how to produce things of value, Others found that they could gain these things at little cost to themselves simply by using coercion to acquire them. So this is going to be written in Das Kapital and it's going to be established that the history of humanity is going to be uh, a history of coercion between the people who want to control that property and the people who actually produce it. Marx believed that structures rather than people or ideas made history. Specifically, Marx spoke of human history and human relations as functions of what we term the base and the superstructure. The base is a system of economic production, including the level of technology, what we call the means of production, and the kind of class relations that exist as a result, the relations of production. So basically, the base is what we understand as reality. Resting on the base is a superstructure, which represents all human institutions, politics and the state, national identity and culture, religion and gender, and so on. Marx viewed this superstructure as a system of institutions created essentially to justify and perpetuate the existing order. We try to follow the status quo. And people consequently suffer from a false consciousness, meaning that they believe they understand the true nature of the world around them, but in reality, they are deluded by the superstructure imposed by capitalism. A worker during the Industrial Revolution did not know better, even if he was coerced into working thousands of hours without sufficient pay and without any health insurance and without any safety whatsoever in their jobs. Marx used this framework to understand historical development and to anticipate the future of capitalism. Marx concluded that human history developed in phases, each driven by a particular kind of exploitation. The phases went from the agrarian societies to feudalism, jumped to aristocracy, and the, develop of cap the development of capitalism and defined the bourgeoisie, whose members sought to gain political power and to remain the economic and social order in a way that better fit capitalist ambition. The last phase, however, involved a revolution, leading by the work, led by the working class or the proletariat to establish a new infrastructure, one that is communist. This is termed a dictatorship of the proletariat. So we, before we move forward, we have to understand the work of Frederick Hegel, who Marx read in order to write Das Kapital, and he understood as the way in which this uh, historic trajectory of humanity is actually interpreted. We're going to have a thesis, an antithesis, and a, and a synthesis. This is going to be a dialectical relationship between the actors involved in a given scenario. The thesis is the establishment. The thesis is what we know as normal. The thesis, in this case, is going to be capitalism. However, the antithesis is going to be all this um, the wrongdoings that capitalism has brought with it, the poverty that people have to endure, all the, all the wrongships of industry, and the synthesis is going to be how we move towards a revolution and how we move towards a more communist, communal relationship with each other in order to reach equality. So again, this thesis and, this is, and synthesis uh, is going to be serving to understand any sort of relationship out there. When we meet another person, this dialectic comes into play. We're going to have our understanding of ourselves, 
we're going to be trying to understand the other. And from that, there's going to be a synthesis, a relationship established. Either we're going to be learning from the other, or we're going to be noticing the difference from the other and making sure that we understand those uh, those uh, the power structures between them. So if I'm a teacher and you're a student, then there's going to be a dialectic between us where I'm going to have a little bit more power than you because, again, I'm the teacher and I have that role and I take that position. And therefore, the synthesis is going to be that relationship that unfolds. So Marx called this entire process dialectical materialism. Dialectic is a term he used to describe history as a struggle between the existing order, the thesis, or the bourgeoisie, and the challenges to that order, the antithesis, resulting in the historical change, the synthesis. Materialism simply refers to the fact that this tension is over material factors, specifically economic ones. Marx believed that revolutions inevitably result from this dialectical process, and we've seen those revolutions um, so on, move so on and so forth throughout history. Two of the most notable followers of Marx's ideas were Vladimir Ilinich's Ilyanov, more, much more commonly known as Lenin, and Mao Zedong. Lenin and Mao came to lead communist revolutions in Russia in 1917 and in China in 1949, respectively. Lenin, in particular, believed that the revolution could be carried out in less advanced countries if leaders constructed a vanguard of the proletariat. His term for a small revolutionary movement that could seize power on behalf of the people who may lack consciousness necessary to rise up. Now, moving on to the way that we control the communist parties, these are going to be uh, communist parties are going to be maintaining this control over society, not only through repression and coercion, but also by carefully allocating power throughout the country's various political, social, and economic institutions. This is called a, a form of co-optation. So again, I'm going to repeat the term co-optation. This strategy can be seen clearly in the formation of a nomenclatura. It's a politically sensitive or, uh, or influential jobs in the state, society, or economy that were staffed by people cho chosen or approved by the Communist Party. The nomenclatura encompassed a wide range of important positions. The head of a university, the editor of a newspaper, a military officer, a film director. Not surprisingly, party approval often required party membership, making joining the party the easiest way to prove one's loyalty and rise up the career ladder. Party membership could also bring other benefits, better housing, the ability to travel abroad, or access to scarce consumer goods. So the nomenclatura is basically going to be a way of control through cooptation, where we're going to be placing specific actors among society in order to control every single aspect of society. The political economic system of communism chooses effectively to eliminate individual freedom to achieve equality. Communist thinkers such as Karl Marx began with the premise that capitalism, with its private property and free markets, cannot truly serve the needs of a society as a whole. Communists view private property and markets as a form of power that inevitably leads one person or group gaining control over others. Economic competition between peoples create exploitation and the development of social classes in which a so small group of wealthy dominates and benefits from the labor of the poor majority. Communist systems use the state to transform markets and property. Private property is fully nationalized, placed in the hands of the state on behalf of the people. In other words, the entire economy becomes a public good, existing for the benefit of all. Because communist states centralize all economic decision-making and ownership, many of the essential tasks of states in other political economic systems are fundamentally different under communism. Taxation, for example, takes an, indir takes an indirect form through fixed prices and wages. Any profit produced by a worker or a firm goes to the state for public expenditures. Labor is allocated by the state. Social expenditures are extensive. All basic services, including healthcare, education, retirement, and even leisure activities, are owned and provided by the state. So everything is a command economy. Everything has to do with central planning, and everything is going to be controlled by the state. Basically, they're going to be nationalizing, nationalizing property and life. So this is going to be key for a communist system. 
In the early 20th century, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin developed Marx's ideas and adapted them to the unique conditions in Russia. Russia's economy was primarily agricultural and lacked a large industrial proletariat, which would rise in revolution. In 1903, Lenin and his followers founded the Bolshevik Party, which seized power in Russia in October 1917. The dictatorship of the proletariat must be achieved fully in order to transition to the full dawn of communism. Under the leadership of Lenin and then Joseph Stalin, the USSR became an authoritarian communist state where the state was in charge of all aspects of life. The opposite of communism is going to be capitalism. It is an economic system in which the production of goods and their distribution depend on the investment of private capital with a view to making a profit. Unlike a command economy, a capitalist economy is going to be run by people who wish to make a profit rather than by the state. Capitalism is inspired by liberalism, which places a high priority on individual political and economic freedom and advocates limiting state power in order to foster and protect this freedom. Liberalism assumes that individuals are best suited to take responsibility for their own behavior and well-being, and thus a free market and private property serve as key tenants, uh, key tenants for this ideology. For liberals, then, the best state is a weak one, constrained in its autonomy and capacity. The liberal tenant of laissez-faire, French for let do, which holds that the economy should be allowed to do what it wishes, is going to be the epitome of this liberal ideology. Again, I'm going to repeat it. It's called laissez-faire, which, which basically means free trade. This is what we typically think of as capitalism, a system of private property and free markets, which is solely based on profit. Liberalism as a political economic system then is defined by its emphasis on individual freedoms over collective equality and on the power of markets over the state. So for the past two decades, social democracy and liberalism have appeared to be the only viable political economic systems, but even the, uh, the countries using the systems have been undergoing further economic liberalization cutting taxes, reducing regulation, privatizing uh, state-owned businesses and public goods, and expanding property rights. With the financialization of the economy, this has become a global trend. So this is the main difference between the liberal economy and a socialist economy in terms of ownership, equality, prices, efficiency, taxes, healthcare, disadvantages, and some advantages as well. Please take a screenshot of it if you need to. A key term here is going to be economic liberalization, which is the lessening of government regulations and restrictions in order to create a greater economic exchange for greater participation by private ent entities. This is going to be key for the creation of those liberal democracies where economic liberalization is going to be allowing for uh, much more innovation, much bigger uh, expenditure, and obviously much greater um, much more money in terms of allowing the state to flourish. However, it's going to be uh, coming with its detriment as well. The first ideological clash among both the USSR and the US is the concept of democracy. The current definition of democracy follows the concept of a liberal democracy, a system of political and social and economic liberties supported by competition, participation, and contestation, such as voting. Liberals argue that despite this shortcoming, a high degree of freedom will produce the greatest amount of general prosperity for the majority. Arguably, while most Europe focused on parliamentary governments, which meant individual liberty and equal rule of law, the USSR believed in a form of representative government that would reach economic equality under the dictatorship of a proletariat. But at the end of the day, it wasn't the proletariat that actually ruled, but rather it was the state itself. A second point of clash is religion. A key belief in Marxism and Leninism was that it was not an all-powerful god who influenced the fate of mankind, but rather economic and material conditions. Religion served as the opium of the masses, which allowed for exploitation at the hands of capitalism. 
European Christians strongly opposed communism as evidence in both Germany, Spain, and Italy post-World War II. So here are the main societal institutions under communism. We're going to be seeing how religion uh, is changed, basically, again, it's an opium for the classes. In terms of gender roles, we are seeing this ideological equality, but women still maintain their role as housewives. In terms of sexu sexuality, we also see uh, an ideal equality among a free love for everybody. However, this is not the case because we do have this traditional patriarchy still established within those communist countries. And in terms of nationalism, we're not going to be clinging to all national strategies, but we're going to be creating a communist nation altogether. So this is the end for the first, uh, uh, the first section of this presentation. We're going to move on to section two. So now we're going to be moving on to section two of this presentation, the Soviet Union and the Western powers from 1917 to 1941. We're starting with the Cold War. We're trying to understand those origins and to ask ourselves, to what extent did the USSR's foreign policy in the interwar years reflect its priorities of defense and regaining territory lost at the end of the First World War? So we're mostly going to be focusing on the USSR's policies in terms of um, getting back the territory lost in World War I and uh, creating that major communist power that they want to be. Historians have argued that the Cold War proceeded from the very moment the Bolsheviks triumphed in Russia in 1917. However, this was more than evident when President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points came to be, which epitomized liberalism. The points called for the self-determination of subject peoples, creation of democratic states, free trade, and collective security through the League of Nations. This period of colonization was supposedly over, and the oceans free for trade. However, the U.S. Congress wasn't so keen on the idea, on, and the country entered a period of isolation until 1941. In the meantime, Lenin preached world revolution at the hands of the working class and nationalized all business, including those owned by foreigners. Basically, the Russian Revolution and the 14 points are going to be the key ideological uh, clash that is going to be starting the Cold War. In the First World War, an alliance was created between Britain, France, the US, Japan, China, and others, including Russia, until 1917 was... Uh, was In the First World War, an alliance between Britain, France, and the U.S., which also included Japan, China, and Russia until 1917, was created. The Allies hoped that by assisting the Whites, they would be able to strangle Bolshevism and prevent it to, sp uh, to spread to Germany, which after the defeat in the First World War in November 1918 was in turmoil and vulnerable to communist revolution. However, Allied intervention was ineffective, and in 1919, French and U.S. troops withdrew, and British troops were withdrawn in 1920. Only Japan's troops remained until the end of the Civil War in 1922. Intervention in the USSR did inevitably fuel Soviet suspicion of Western power. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, British Foreign Minister Lord Curzon proposed that the frontier with Russia should be about 160 kilometers to the east of Warsaw, Poland's newly created capital. This demarcation became known as the Kursen Line. Poland, however, rejected this and exploited the chaos in Russia to seize as much territory as it could. In 1920, Poland launched an invasion of Ukraine, but by the end of the year, Bolshevik forces had pushed the Poles back to Warsaw. With the help of military supplies and advisors from France, Poland uh, rallied and managed to inflict a decisive defeat on the Red Army, driving out uh, the Red Army of much of the territory that Poland claimed. The struggle ceased in 1921 when Poland signed the Treaty of Riga with Russia and was awarded considerable, considerable areas of Ukraine and Belarus, in which Poles form only a minority of the population. The creation of Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland helped further isolate Russia geographically and developed into a cordon sanitaire, a zone of states to prevent the spread of communism to the rest of Europe. So, 
when we're dealing with the USSR at this moment, we're seeing a USSR that is fighting back the spread of this Western ideology. We're seeing a USSR that is trying to hold its ground from the territories that they have gained from World War I and that, that was taken away in World War I as well. And we're seeing a USSR that is now fighting Poland and fighting newly created states at the, hand, at the expense of being isolated from the rest of Europe. So this is going to be the Soviet foreign policy from 1922 to 1945. The consolidation of communist states was a priority for Lenin. The USSR supported subversive activities carried out by communist groups or sympathizers within the Western democracies and their colonies. These activities were coordinated by the Comintern, a communist organization set up in Moscow in 1919 to coordinate the efforts of communist around the world to achieve a worldwide revolution. So the common term is going to be this organization that is going to be striving to connect the world and unite the, the workers of the world in order to create a worldwide revolution. The coming to power of Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany in 1933 led to a radical change in Soviet foreign policy. Nazi Germany, with its hatred of communism and stated goal of annexing vast territories in the Soviet Union for colonization, presented a threat to the USSR's very existence. Efforts against the Nazis developed in a defensive alliance. In 1934, the USSR joined the League of Nations, which Stalin hoped to turn into a more effective instrument of collective security. In 1935, Stalin also signed a pact with France and Czechoslovakia in the hope that this would lead to close military cooperation against Germany. French suspicion, uh, suspicions of Soviet communism prevented this development, but in September 1938, in response to Hitler's, Hitler's threat to invade Czechoslovakia, Stalin was apparently ready to intervene, provided France did likewise. However, Hitler's last-minute decision to agree to a compromise proposal at the Munich Conference of, 19, of, uh, of 1938 um, ensured that Soviet assistance was not needed. The fact that the USSR was not invited to the conference reinforced Stalin's fears that Britain, France, and Germany would work together against the USSR. So basically, uh, the USSR wants to prevent Hitler from expanding, but the rest of Western Europe doesn't really want to do with uh, the communism that the USSR is promoting. With Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1939, the British and the French sought the same defensive alliance with Stalin that, they, that Stalin had proposed before. However, this was tough. Stalin's demand the that the Soviet Union should have the right to intervene in the affairs of the small states on her western border if they were threatened with internal subversions by the Nazis, as Czechoslovakia had been in 1938, was rejected outright by the British. The USSR, in turn, became a suspicious being. The country most involved in the fighting against, the Germ uh, against Germany could not reach any negotiations. Uh, basically, what was concluded was having Poland's and Romanian's consent to have, it, to have the Red Army cross their territory in the event of war, but, the, but they had to actually ask permission in order to do so. Until 1939, Hitler saw Poland as a possible ally in the future war against the USSR for the conquest of Lebensraum, literally living space. They wanted to expand their territory for the resettlement of Germans in the USSR and Eastern Europe. Poland's acceptance of the Anglo-French guarantee forced him to reconsider his position and respond positively to those advisors advocating temporary cooperation with the Soviet Union. Stalin, whose priorities were the defense of the USSR and the recovery of parts of the former Russian Empire, was ready to explore German proposals for a non-aggression pact in the same year, 1939. Not only did it commit both, both powers to benevolent neutrality towards each other, but in a secret pro pro protocol, it outlined the German and Soviet spheres of interest in Eastern Europe. The Baltic states and Bessarabia in Romania fell within the Soviet sphere, while Poland was to be divided between them. So here is when the Nazis and the Soviets agree to basically take over the territories of Poland and to um, just make sure that they kept their territories uh, separate from each other as long as they, there was no war between them. On the 1st of September of 1939, Germany invaded Poland and Britain and France declared war on Germany. 
The Soviet Union, as agreed secretly in the Nazi-Soviet pact, began the invasion of Eastern Poland on the 17th of December of that same year, although by this time German army had all but defeated Polish forces. By the beginning of October, Poland was completely defeated and was divided between the Soviet Union and Germany, with the Soviets receiving the larger part. With the, the aim of defending the USSR against the aggression of Germany and to recover parts of the former Russian Empire, Stalin strengthened the USSR Western defenses. He signed mutual assistance pact with Estonia and Latvia in October 1939. The Lithuanians were pressured into agreeing to the establishment of Soviet bases in their territory. In 1940, after a brief war with Finland, the USSR acquired the Hanko naval base and other territories along the mutual border. Stalin's reaction to the defeat of France in June 1940, which meant German domination of, Germ of Europe, was to annex the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and annex Bessarabia and northern Bukovia from Romania. Basically, the USSR wanted to create another, another cordon sanitaire in order to prevent any further conflict with the Nazis, and obviously later on to prevent any, any conflict with the Allies. In June 1941, Germany invaded the Soviet Union, and the USSR became allies with Britain against Nazi Germany, soon to be joined by the U.S. So again, nobody could be trusted, and at the end, the USSR had to actually keep on fighting Germany because the Nazis invaded them. So in this map, we can see the, inv the invasion of the Soviet Union but at the hands of the Nazis, and how these German invasion routes uh, basically go all the way to Moscow, and Leningrad. However, because of the geographic situation of the Soviet Union, this became impossible. And obviously, the intervention of the US helped a lot. Now, for the third section of this presentation, this is the Grand Alliance from 1941 to 1945. Again, notice the chronology of the events. We're going to be using this guiding question, in what ways did the UR aims and ambitions of the USSR, US, and Great Britain conflict? On December 7, 1941, Japan's attack on the naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, brought the US into the war, as the US immediately declared war on Japan and Axis power. In response, Germany and Italy both declared war against the US on December 11. Germany was now confronted with a grand alliance of Britain, the U.S., and the USSR, the leaders of which became known as the Big Three. With 25 million casualties, the USSR was able to survive the war since it became key in the destruction of the German army, army by 1945. Nevertheless, the Big Three had conflicting aims for post-war Europe. The USSR aim, so here is the diagram that's going to be basically comprising the different aims that we have for each country. I would highly recommend that you take a screenshot of this or you use this in your notes to organize them. Stalin wanted security for the USSR and reparations from the Axis powers to help rebuild the Soviet economy. He wanted land that the Soviet Union, Union had annexed from Poland in 1939 in compensation Poland could get some German territory beyond the other river. They also wanted the Baltic provinces of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, territory lost to Finland in 1941, Bessarabia and northern Bukovia from Romania as well. In Eastern Europe, Stalin focused on three different areas. An area on the direct Soviet control in Eastern Europe, which was basically Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and for a, for a time, the, the Soviet zone in Germany. An intermediate zone, which was neither fully communist nor fully capitalist, comprising Yugoslavia, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Finland. The communists would share power uh, there with the liberal moderate so socialist and peasant parties, so it was basically a mixed government. These areas would act as a bridge between Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the U.S. And the last area was non-communist uh, Western Europe, which would also include Greece. Stalin wanted to continue close cooperation with Britain and the U.S. even after the end of the war. In 1943, he dissolved the common term as a gesture to, conv to convince his allies that the USSR was no longer supporting the global revolution. So it, it was very clear what the USSR wanted at this time. They wanted to uh, make sure that their alliances with the other um, 
the other part of the big three were intact and that they had the security um, within that la cordon, la, uh, cordon sanitaire that was um, between both communist and non-communist states. Revisionist historians have shown that the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the dramatic developments in air technology during the war made the U.S. feel vulnerable to potential threats from foreign powers. Consequence, consequently, as early as 1943, the U.S. began to draw up plans for a chain of bases which would give the country control of both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. This would also give U.S. industry access to the raw, raw materials and markets of most of Western Europe and Asia. National security at the hands of the U.S. became a threat to the Soviets. American liberalism also promoted the competition of democratic states, where tariffs and economic nationalism would be abolished. The U.S. government was determined that there should be no more attempts by Germany or Italy to create autocratic economies, and that the British and French should too need to, uh, would be forced to allow other states to trade freely with their empires. Basically, they wanted uh, uh, the deconstruction of colonialism. The U.S. commitment to establishing democratic states meant that they supported the colonization of the European colonial empires. So no more colonies. Those colonies were going to be independent. And obviously, because of liberalism, the U.S. is going to be, coming, is going to be sneaking into those countries and using their economies by uh, creating this liberalization of their markets. These ideas of decolonization were embodied in the Atlantic Charter, a statement of fundamental principles for the post-World War. The most important of these principles were free trade, no more territorial annexation by Britain or the US, and the right of people to choose, to choose their own governments. The Charter would later evolve into the United Nations Organization, an assembly where all the nations of the world would be represented. Although real power and influence would be wielded by an executive committee or security council dominated with the power of veto by the Soviet Union, Britain, China, France, and the United States. Only five states, only five states have the power of veto. The British government's main aims in 1944 were to ensure the survival of Great Britain as an independent great power still in possession of its empire and to remain on friendly terms with both the U.S. and the USSR. They wanted to safeguard the Suez Canal in Egypt since it was the country's main route to India and the eastern oil markets, and to safeguard democracy in Warsaw, the capital of Poland. So finally, um, this big three are going to be coming together to actually decide on the state of affairs of the world after 1943. We're going to start with the Foreign Ministers' Conference in Moscow. So again, in October 1943, the foreign ministers of the U.S., USSR, and Britain met in Moscow, the Soviet Union's capital, in an effort to reconcile the conflicting ambitions of their states. They agreed to establish the European Advisory Commission to finalize plans for their post-war allied occupation of Germany. They also issued the Declaration on General Security. This proposed the creation of a world organization to maintain global peace and security, the United Nations. At the Tehran Conference, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin met for the first time to discuss post-war Europe, the future organization of the UN, and the fate of Germany. Stalin was clear about his territorial ambitions, and there was no opposition. Churchill flew to Moscow and proposed a division of southeastern Europe into distinct spheres of interest. This formed the basis of an agreement that gave the USSR 90, 90 and 75% predominance in Romania and Bulgaria, respectively, and Britain 90% in Greece, while Yugoslavia and Hungary were to be divided equal into British and Soviet zones of interest. Churchill, however, got cold feet and the agreement was dropped. However, those zones of influence still remain afterwards. The question is the liberalization of Europe from 1943 to 1945, and our guiding question is how far did the liberalization of Europe intensify the rivalry and this trust between the big three. So again, this is a chart that you need to copy for your notes. This is what I'm going to be covering in this section of the presentation.
The liberalization of Eastern Europe by the Soviet army and Western Europe by predominantly Anglo-American forces in 1944 and 1945 created the context for the Cold War in Europe. It was indeed in Europe where the Cold War both started and ended. So we're first going to be focusing on Eastern Europe from 1944 to 1945. Bulgaria, Finland, Italy, Hungary, and Romania were Axis states, although they were allowed to their, allow their own governments after the, their occupation by the Allied powers, real power rested with the Allied Control Commissions, or ACCs. The first Allied Control Commission was established in southern Italy in 1943 by Britain and the U.S. after the collapse of the fascist government there. As the USSR had no troops in Italy, it was not represented on the first ACC. Soviet officials dominated the ACCs in Romania, Bulgaria, Finland, and Hungary. In this respect, Soviet policy was a mirror image of Anglo-American policy in Italy. Governments in exiles and partisan groups were also key in this conflicting power. In the states actually occupied by the Germans and Italians in Eastern and Southern Europe, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, Greece, and Yugoslavia, Governments and exiles were established in London during the war. They were made up of mainly politicians who had managed to escape the German occupation, yet being in London, they lost control of the partisan groups fighting in the occupied territories. Except Poland, communist partisan groups emerged as the strongest local forces, and their leaders were not ready to take orders from their governments in exile. These partisans group, partisan groups were sometimes substituted by Stalin himself. So again, many of these countries are going to be in exile. Most of the monarchies in Europe at the time uh, were sent to England to take uh, cover, basically, from all the turmoil in their countries. And ultimately, those partisan groups are going to be the true power within the territory of those countries. In the liberated territories, Stalin advised the local communi communist parties to form popular fronts or alliances with the liberal, socialist, and peasant parties. So, basically, the USSR is going to be intervening in pretty much every single state that has a democracy by creating a communist party within it. So we are basically going to cover how the USSR intervened in Eastern Europe in the country in a country-to-country -country basis. Stalin was determined not only to regain the territories that fell into the Soviet sphere of interest as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact, but also to ensure that there was a pro-Soviet uh, pro government in Poland. In effect, this meant forcibly establishing a communist dictatorship as the majority of Poles were strongly anti-Soviet and anti-communist. In Tehran, Britain and the U.S. had agreed to the Soviet annexation of Poland, up to the Kherson line. As the Red Army advanced, they systematically destroyed the nationalist Polish resistance group, also known as the Polish Home Party, who were also directly fighting the Germans. Stalin fatally undermined the authority of the Polish government in exile in London by establishing the Committee of National Liberation, based in Lublin in Poland, which became known as the Lublin Committee. It's tasked to administer Soviet-occupied Poland and eventually to form the core of a future pro-Soviet government. The Polish Home Army, in turn, revolted against the Germans during the Warsaw Uprising of 1944 in a desperate attempt to seize control of parts of Poland before the Red Army could overrun the whole country. But they were defeated nevertheless by the Nazis. The Red Army therefore moved on. They had created a Soviet security organization responsible for enforcing obedience to the government and eliminating opposition called the NKVD. They were to shoot and imprison all participants of the Home Army and eliminate any opposition. In January 1945, the USSR formally recognized the Communist-Dominated Committee for Liberal National Liberation as a provisional government of Poland. Britain and the US, although they still supported Poland's government in exile in London, played down the significance of this in the interest of the unity of the Grand Alliance. So at the end of the day, even though the Big Three had had an alliance, and even though Poland was still a key state in Europe in terms of its democ democracy and liberalization, it fell to the Red Army. 
On August 20th, 1944, the Soviets launched a major offensive to drive the German army out of the Balkans. The immediate consequence of this brought about the collapse of the pro-German regimes in both Romania and Bulgaria. Both states would protect the southwest border of the USSR. Soviet control of Romania would allow access to Yugoslavia and Central Europe and enable it, it to strengthen its strateg a strategic position in the Black Sea. Control of Bulgaria also meant access to Greece and Turkey. The Soviet Union was also determined to re-annex the Romanian territories of Bessarabia and northern Bukovina, which it had, it had occupied in 1940 and attacked in 1944. Romanian's king deposed the pro-German government on August 23rd. The king hoped, like Italy, that Romania would be allowed to negotiate a ceasefire with the Western allies and then form a new government in which communists would only be a minority. Britain and the U.S. played dumb yet again for the sake of the Grand Alliance. The king had no alternative but to negotiate an armistice on September 12th with the Soviets who now occupied the country. While an Allied Control Commission had been established with the help of the Red Army, Romanian communists orchestrated a coup which led to the creation of the pro-Soviet communist-dominated National Democratic Front government. The occupation of Romania allowed the Soviets to invade Bulgaria in early September 1944 and establish an ACC there as well. Local communists, including several thousand partisan troops, had already established the Patriotic Front, an alliance of anti-German, left-wing forces. The Front seized power from the pro-German government of Konstantin Muraviev and established a uh, government in Sofia, shortly before the Red Army arrived. A communist revolution ensued, and 10,000 bourgeoisie were executed. The USSR, however, did not want to break the Grand Alliance and kept the communist revolution at bay, seeking to tolerate the opposition. In Yugoslavia, Joseph Broz Tito was one of the most successful partisan leaders in, Euro in German-occupied Europe. As a communist, he looked to the USSR as a model for the state he wished to create in Yugoslavia, but his very independence and self-confidence caused Stalin his considerable problems. Tito was anti-German and against non-communist Serbs and Croat nationalists, and thus he gained support of Britain due to his effectiveness against the Nazis. Nonetheless, his partisans formed communist-dominated committees which took their orders from him rather than the Yugoslav government in exile in London. He was therefore successful in taking over Yugoslavia and Albania. Tito's ambition led him to impose a plan to create a federation with Bulgaria, which Stalin shut down. He needed Tito as an ally, but not that much. Instead, Stalin coerced Tito into following the USSR foreign policy. However, Tito was like uh, Stalin's bad child. The Communist Controlled People's Liberation Army or ELAS, emerged in Greece as the most effective resistance force and fought Germans and non-communist guerrilla groups. By 1944, ELAS was able to launch a communist takeover of Greece. Yet, as Greece was an area regarded by the USSR as still being under the British sphere of influence, Stalin urged ELAS to join a moderate coalition government with non-communist parties. When Tito encouraged a communist revolution later on, Stalin sided with Churchill and raised no objection to communist defeat. Stalin, wanting to keep alive the possibility of cooperation with non-communist parties in order to protect Soviet interests, local communist parties were consequently ordered in, uh, to enter into a democratic coalition government in both uh, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and to work with these uh, to consolidate their position for both countries. When Soviet troops crossed the Hungarian frontier in September 1944, head of state Admiral Miklos Horthy appealed to the Soviets for a ceasefire, but the Red Army keep pressing until reaching the capital Budapest. In the Soviet occupation section, in the Soviet occupied section of the country, the Hungarian Communist Party was initially too weak to play a dominant role in politics, and it therefore had little option but to cooperate with the Socialist Party, the Smallholders Party, a Peasants Party, and other parties altogether. When elections took place in 1945, the Communist Party only got 17% of votes, but were given three key posts in, provision, in the provisional government. 
Stalin would take Hungary's reparations since they had been German allies. The Czechoslovaks felt betrayed by Britain and France over the Munich Agreement of 1938 and looked to the USSR as a power that would restore their country's pre-1938 borders. In 1943, the Czechoslovak government in exile in London under Edward Venis, the former president, negotiated an alliance with the USSR. When the provisional government was formed in 1945, the Communist Party was able to demand eight seats in the cabinet, including the influential ministries of interior and information, to achieve harmony under the Grand Alliance. So basically, slowly but surely, the Communist parties were infiltrating this newly created government in this post-war war states. Now, in the summer of, of 1944, when Soviet troops invaded Finland, uh, the country was granted an armistice and unexpectedly generous terms. The Finns had to declare war on the Germans, cede part, as part of the strategically important Pestamo region on the Arctic Ocean, and pay reparations for uh, the troubles of that war with the USSR. Finland was in a position to give the USSR vitally needed reparations, such as barges, railroad equip equipment, and manufactured goods, which allowed them to retain their political freedom. The Finnish Communist Party was weak and unpopular, and the USSR had little option but to rely on the non-communist parties for help. So we've talked about the eastern side of Europe. Now we're going to move on to the western side. Again, now it's Western Europe from 1944 to 1945. First, we're starting with the liberation of Italy. Obviously, Italy and France were liberated by Western allies. Italy was a leading Axis state, while France, until its defeat in 1940, had played a main part in the war against Germany. So when we talk about Italy, we need to talk about an Italy that just went through a fascist regime. After the Allied landings in Sicily in 1943, Mussolini, the Italian fascist dictator, was overthrown and imprisoned. This did not prevent German troops from seizing Italy's capital, Rome, and occupying most of the Italian peninsula. The Allies were then forced to fight their way up to the peninsula until 1945. Italy was the first Axis, Axis state to sign an armistice, and the way it was administered by the Allies set important precedents for the future. Soviet requests were rejected and inspired Stalin decisions over Eastern Europe. So as long as it was Eastern Europe, Stalin had a say in things and, and how things went. And if it was Western Europe, then Britain and the U.S. had a say in how things went. Uh, so Stalin basically contacted the leader of the Italian Communist Party, Palmiro Togliatti, to form an alliance with the Socialist Party and to draft a reform to help workers and peasants, which would prepare the way for later Communist Party electoral successes. In a newly formed coalition government, Togliatti became Minister of Ju Justice, and uh, Stalin's policy was therefore to push the Italian Communist Party into joining a government multi-party coalition. So again, same thing as in Eastern Europe, Stalin is going to be intervening, but he's going to be doing it subvertly by putting people into positions of power. When Paris was liberated in 1944, General Charles de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, immediately established an independent government. His aim was to rebuild French power and to create a powerful French-led uh, Western Europe. Um, to counter the predominance of the Anglo-Americans, he looked to the Soviet Union, and in December 1944, they signed the Franco-Soviet Treaty of Alliance and Mutual Assistance, which committed both states to, to cooperate in any future defensive war against Germany. The French Communist Party further uh, gained a prominent role in politics. So the French are going to be more independent, the most independent out of all the states that we've talked so far. And therefore, uh, while they do have a pact in terms of uh, safety for between both the USSR and France, uh, at the end of the day, the French are going to be siding with the West, while the USSR is going to be uh, staying with the East. So these are all the countries that we're going to cover in these presentations. Make sure that you have your notes divided up into each country because as we move forward, we're going to be looking at the same chronological uh, timeline of events within each of these countries. These are the different regions that you're going to be using to answer the questions in paper two.
Now, for the last section of this presentation, we're going to be talking about the Yalta Conference that happened in February 1945. And basically, we need to talk about the achievements of what happened at the Yalta Conference. Here's a diagram that you need to, that you need to uh, put in your notes. So make sure that you have arrangements for post-war Germany, uh, the establishment of Poland's borders, the creation of the United Nations, and the declaration of uh, liberated Europe. The Yalta Conference, attended by Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, was the last of the wartime conferences and the first of the post-war summits. To finalize the occupation of Germany, each power was allotted its own zone, including a section of Berlin, which was placed under four power control. The United Nations also came into being. Issues with Poland arose Issues with Poland arose from the ambiguous terms established in Yalta. They confirmed that Poland's eastern border would run along the Kherson line. They agreed in principle, as they had at Tehran, that in compensation for the land lost to the USSR, Poland would receive a substantial increase in territory in the north and west from the land to be removed from Germany. The exact details of this, of this agreement were not stated. The decision was also taken to reorganize the provisional government by including democratic politicians from both Poland and the London government in exile. Elections would be held as soon as possible. Stalin therefore took advantage of this and manipulated the situation. The exact amount of land given to the Polish was not fixed and the definition of democracy was up in the air. Obviously, democracy for the Russians are going to be, is going to be different than democracy for Western Europe. To underpin the right of the liberated states to determine their own governments, Roosevelt persuaded Stalin and Churchill at Yalta to agree to the Declaration on Liberated Europe, which committed the three governments to carry out emergency measures to assist the liberated states and to encourage democratic governments. This is an excerpt from the Declaration itself. Let me read it to you. The three governments will jointly assist the people in any liberated state or former Axis satellite state in Europe were in their judgment conditions required to establish conditions of internal peace, to carry out emergency measures for the relief of distressed people, to form interim governmental authorities broadly representative of all democratic elements in the population and pledge to the earliest possible establishment through free election of government responsive to the will of the people and to facilitate where necessary the holdings of such elections. So even with this declaration, the, the definition of democracy is up in the air, the definition of free elections is up in the air, and the definition of will of the people is up in the air for the, both the USSR and the rest of the world. In the final weeks of the war, British and US forces raced to Trieste, Italy, in an attempt to stop Yugoslav forces seizing the port, while the British army in northern Germany crossed the river Elbe to prevent Soviets from occupying Denmark. Both half of Berlin and Prague fell for Soviet troops. However, this marked the end of the Second World War. So here's our bibliography. Thank you so much to David Williamson for his uh, book on the Cold War. And we recognize the authors of our all visual or auditory content that is included in this presentation. Again, thanks for listening, and I hope to see you soon.